Warning, the following video is not suitable for all audiences. If you are a bald-headed, insecure, fat, and immature black woman, you might want to stop the video now. Viewer discretion is advised. So, I watched about four episodes of The Real Housewives of Atlanta Season 6. Got a little bit familiar with the characters. And here is my first review of the show. I was going to review it last week for episode 12, but... I ended up not doing it, but I had to do this one. Here it is, The Real Housewives of Atlanta Season 6, Episode 13, titled Pillow Talk or Pillow Fight, Review, Recap, and Opinion by Meat Magazine. And if I could sum up what I think about this show in one episode, because it disturbs me severely, I would title it, After Watching This Show, I Will Be Marrying a White Woman. The episode starts out with some bulldog-faced bitch named Phaedra and her flamboyant homosexual event planner D. White, who is wearing his Jungle Book jacket. The two are planning a party for Phaedra's six-month-old baby Dylan, and the theme is a presidential inauguration. The event will be hosted at a huge estate. The cost of renting the mansion is $3,850. The invitations are $2,850. They will also be having champagne and caviar, so the cost of a caterer will be $4,200. And finally, she wanted a presidential flash mob dance with guys in black suits, which will cost an additional $4,000 for a grand total of $14,900. bucks. That's a Toyota. And obviously, the 50 to 75 guests that Phaedra calls herself entertaining are there for her ego and enjoyment. This party was not for that baby at all. If he is eating caviar and drinking champagne at his age, I need to be hanging out with him. I mean, she needs to be arrested and deported. In our next scene, we visit Industry Studios. Cynthia is meeting up with her very black husband with a white beard named Peter. And Peter's black face and white beard makes him look like a skunk to me. So I nicknamed him Peter Le Pew. Come to find out, they share the same workspace, which is funny because I think that his big ass balls would need their own building, or at least their own desk. You see, Cynthia won't sleep with Peter because the last time she laid with that skunk looking motherfucker, it took her 30 tomato baths to get the scent off of her. Smart girl. Anyway, Cynthia tells Peter that Nene is throwing a couples event where there will be a pillow talk, kind of like a truth to dare for adults that never grew up she well perfect for Portia anyway she informs Peter that some dark butt with red hair named Candy alleges that she knows some stuff about Peter's past so Peter will bring this up during Nene's event but he isn't worried about Candy or little red riding hood rat as I call her Cynthia wants him to be careful where he sprays his skunk juice, so she warns him to go easy breezy on the other hose. So now we are catching up with Kenya and her bald-headed Aunt Lori, who spilled Raymond noodles on her head. Or at least that's what she looks like. Kenya is finally ready as a 40-something-year-old woman to have children. Stupid American bitches for you. She knows dang well her eggs are stiff, boiled, and rotten. And if she does have a baby at her age, it's going to have more birth defects than the first batch of PlayStation 4s. Can you say recall? So Aunt Lori brings up a great point. Their family is already screwed up. I mean, Kenya's mother gave birth to her and abandoned her ass in a basket on a stranger's doorstep. And then Kenya's mind is all over the place like Kurt Cobain. So the crazy bitch tells Aunt Lori that she may be bald as an eagle, but she is right. Side note, come to find out, like her mother, Kenya doesn't want any girls. How ironic. So she sits down with Dr. Thompson, a black woman with the glittery green eyeshadow on. And I mean, she looks like a, a leprechaun busted a nut in her eye. I mean, I, I don't know why darkies think that they look good with shit like that on. But anyway, Dr. Thompson informs her that she has some good news and some bad news. The good news is that Kenya has normal hormone levels. The bad news is that her ovarian reserves are diminished. That's a fancy medical way of saying a bitch ain't got no eggs. So unless weird science can give her a baby, 
she'll have to rely on the Bible and the magic of a white Jesus. Yep, as Kenya stated, if God can give Sarah a fictional character in the Bible, a baby at the age of 90, well, white Jeebus can come down on a cloud and hand her an immaculate, concepted baby. Yeah, keep praying, Kenya. You're gonna need it. Better find a stork, bitch. Should have been nice in your lifetime, maybe you would find a real man instead of an invisible man over in Africa. Now, I've heard racist jokes all my life about people being so black you can't see them, and apparently it's true about Kenya's man. And we can't even hear him, he's so black. So the doctor tells Kenya that her first option is to try to get pregnant with some guy with super sperm, but met the man is in a relationship, so that ain't gonna happen. The other option is donor eggs. but. Kenya wants to have a baby with her own DNA. Yeah, right. You better adopt. I mean, why curse a baby with raggedy genetics? And at your age and with your genes, that baby will come out with a horn on the top of his head and mooing. Anyway, Kenya begins talking with the doctor about stupid ideas like having a turkey basting party. You know, where a woman lays on her back with her legs spread and her friends come over with a bucket of sperm and super soaker water guns and shoot it up her canal? Yeah, sounds messy. So Kenya decides that seeing that she loves sperm, visiting a sperm bake would be a great idea. She might have to make a withdrawal and put her money where her mouth is, if you know what I mean. And when she finds out that she can pick a sperm donor who went to Harvard, the stereotypical black gold digging bitch was sold on the idea. So now we're at the candy factory and it's nine weeks to the opening night of Candy's play. She meets up with her manager, Don Juan, who looks like a gay version of the rapper, The Game. And for whatever reason, her jobless fiance, Todd the Opportunist is there. And the gay guy, Don Juan, who was obviously jealous of my boo thing, Portia, begins, make f begins making fun of her. He starts imitating her singing, Amazing Grace. Which is of course her signature song, which she sounds great singing. Love you boo. Anyway, this clown claims to not like drama, yet he's sitting up there making fun of Portia Almighty. Now, I'm gonna roast him good in the future, in a future review, just for the record. Moving along, Candy informs Todd that Cynthia said that he is a male gold digger that would be better suited for Kenya. And then she tells, she tells him about Nini's pajama party. At first, the thought of Todd wearing a Speedo with his nipple tassels in a room full of adults disturbed him, but Candy, being the breadwinner in the relationship, told him that yes, he will in fact be coming. Yeah, she sunned him. So now we're catching up with Kenya Moore and her gay friend, Mr. Lawrence. And he forces people to call him Miss Lawrence because he likes to pretend that he's a chick. Anyway. As a pretentious little bald-headed high heel wearing negative homosexual stereotype, he can barely get in the sperm bank, the sperm bank's door good before he's at the front desk begging the receptionist, Miss Jill, a real woman, for some of the business's spear lube. Now, what kind of a pushy twink walks into a business bald-headed wearing heels and sporting the most annoying nasally congested homosexual voice of all time just ask people for spear lubricants for his anus devil and of course Kenya was rightfully embarrassed as trashy as she is and most people probably didn't catch something he said that they have the best lube around wow so he has been to the sperm bank for four he must have thought it said sperm bar on the sign outside and he wanted to come have a drink like, y'all got a sperm water fountain up here? And refreshments? Now, you know that something is wrong with the world that you live in when the gay guy knows all about the, the lube at the sperm bar. I mean, sperm bank. So, I just hope that he isn't a donor. You know, gays don't reproduce for a reason. You know, so stay in your lane, buddy. Keep driving the Hershey Highway. No woman in her right mind is trying to get injected or inject herself with sperm that looks like gravy, if you know what I mean. How you doing? So Lawrence and Kenya are sitting there in the lobby when a sperm donor walks by and the show must have paid this funny looking, oddly shaped head having motherfucker because these two are pretending that this man is paradise on legs and his broke ass 
stood up there and told a flat out lie. Well, several lies. Typical black guy. He claims that he wants to nut in as many cups as possible because he is the last of his family lineage and he is good looking. Now in reality, he's just broken desperate and needs that little $50 to, from coming in a cup that he receives. He's just some poor black guy without a job. <laughs> I don't know anybody like that. Anyway, so now Sheridan of Zytec Corporation pops up and brings them to meet Michael. Come to find out a cup of nut costs four hundred and seventy five dollars per sample. <laughs> Would you like a couple nut with that cup of tea? Anyway, and they find out they have open identity donors. So the gold digger Kenya begins asking whether or not they have Michael Jordan or Obama sperm there because like so many crazy black chicks, she's obsessed with the idea of having a child with a celebrity. <clears throat> so he has to have a list of certain qualities. He has to be funny, affectionate, well-groomed, nobody older, over six foot four inches tall, handsome with full lips, a nice slender nose, and she prefers green eyes. Yeah. Mm. She wants a white man. Anyway, this is why black chicks like Kenya will die single. Ah. So anyway, okay. All jokes aside, Peter has more sperm in one ball than the whole sperm bake has ever had since they opened. She could always let Peter, the skunk, make a baby with her, you know, but she'd have to fuck skunk man in an Olympic sized pool because once Peter bust that nut he got built up in him, he could shut down Japan with that tidal wave. Cynthia got skunk man backed up like traffic in Atlanta during that snowstorm. Poor Peter. Guys named Peter stay losing on these reality shows. Anyway, in our next scene. It's time to visit Phaedra's party that she claims is for her baby. Yeah, Dylan's fake inauguration. The, that orangutan looking bitch will never give birth to a future president unless he's going to be the president of Mommy Defending Daddy and Core LLC. Anyway, the party was alright I guess, even though the thugged out white boy that Phaedra is married to refused to dance with his fat wife. I mean, I don't blame him. He saw her in that black and white polka dot dress looking like a fat black ladybug it just wasn't hearing that so let's move along so let's get to the good part so now we're at some fat man named Nini's house for this stupid adult slumber party and she has the same haircut as Dennis the Menace anyway after everyone arrives minus Kenya and her sidekick a man and woman come through to serve the guests as half naked waiter and waitress and I was like "Ooh, that chick is hot then that cross-dresser named Nini told her to twirl around and her ass looked like she sat on a barbed wire fence. She had dents and cuts and all sorts of disgusting shit going on. God must hate her. I swear light-skinned bitches stay losing nowadays, but I still smash though. Anyway, Nini, the trans testicle, is prancing around like a horse in heat and showing off his outfit and being annoying thankfully a ball didn't fall out from beneath that dress anywho Nini announced that this event this event ooh, look at me talking like a Puerto Rican anyway she announced that this event is helping with the guest relationships and they are going to play some questions and answers games so our gracious co-host Princess Portia passes out some cards to all of the guests and after a few questions are asked Peter the skunk has a card which reads would you feel comfortable with your lover being bisexual? So Nini blurts out, Portia, that might be a question that you can answer. Really, my man? It's like that, Nini? These trainees are really getting out of line nowadays. They have no respect for women. So Portia, being the high-class, intelligent, poisoned, downright perfect goddess that she is, promptly responded to caveman Nini by saying, I wouldn't be comfortable with my man being bisexual or heterosexual, nothing. You need to be all about Porsche sexual if you're with me. Wow. Her own sister just sat there with a look on her face like, is this bitch retarded? I bet this bitch can't count from one to serp. So with that said, I take back me calling Porsche intelligent. She's perfect other than being stupid. You know, I could see myself being married to her now. You know, I hand her a Christmas gift and she's all crying and stuff and hugging me and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then she look at me in the eye and say, that's the most beautiful box that anyone has ever given me. 
But you know what? I don't care if Portia is so stupid that she thought that the Underground Railroad was a TV show hosted by Don Cornelius. I still wreck Portia like Paul Walker. Yeah. So Kenya Whore, I mean Kenya Moore, pops up with this gay dude named Brandon. And when Nene sees who it is at the door, she shuts the door in her face. Boy, that transvestite Nene sure knows how to start a fight. And Kenya stays losing. She can't have babies. Her mom abandoned her. And now Nene is shedding the door in her face. Aw, poor thing. But she can always jump off a bridge, I guess. Anyway, Kenya looks hot, of course. Seeing that her looks are the one thing that she does have going for herself. And her gay pet didn't even wash its paws before the little bitch started digging its nasty, filthy claws in the food. I, for one, know that people's eating habits express their etiquette in the bedroom. For example, if a person eats sloppily, then they eat sloppily. People who gulp down their food, gulp down genitals. And homos who don't wash their hands before eating, don't wash their butts before eating either. Just saying. So, come to find out, me and Portia are compatible. Is that proper grammar? I don't care. Anyway, I thought that I thought that we were, and after what she said in this scene, it confirmed it for me. She said that she doesn't want her man going to strip clubs. Something that as of now, unless I was shooting a movie, a music video, etc., I never do. That's what polls in the bedroom are for. I guess losers who pay bitches to strip at the club don't know any porn stars that will put out for free. Oh well, keep making it rain, you fucking losers. <laughs> anyway, back to the show. I totally agree with Portia not wanting her man to go to the strip club. I mean, what type of woman is comfortable with it? Anyway, let me stop. Most Anyway, yeah. So, Peter is very defensive about people not condoning strip club visits. He states that he loves the strip club, as well as Apollo, the career criminal, who's married to a lawyer because he always needs one, and Todd, the opportunist, goes as well because his next come up might be right there on stage. He claims that the club isn't so much like a club, but rather more like an office, and that he would pay his friend to get a for his friend to get a lap dance but Peter a guy that only gets his dick wet in the shower claims that he won't allow a woman to rub up on his skunk pole and I'm left thinking that his stupid comment about not receiving lap dances and going there to like socialize or whatever as opposed to going there for the women you know it reminds me of back in the day when people used to say you know that they don't read Playboy Rather, they don't look at Playboy for the pictures, but they read it for the articles. I mean, Peter's balls are so full, it looks like he has a bubble butt in the front of his pants. And this little stinker is going to sit up there and lie and pretend that he wouldn't let a bitch sit on his lap, even if he was at the mall dressed as a jet black Santa Claus? Negro, you lie. Come to find out Apollo, the scam artist, couldn't adopt a drug addiction or a gambling addiction like most losers. This guy has a strip club, ad club addiction. He has wasted $5,000 and even $8,000 in one night. You could start a record label with that. Or sponsor, sponsor a Porsche for a month with $13,000. In his defense, he said the same thing to Nini that I would have if I was in his position. He said, you spend your money on shoes or drinks, it's my money. That's right, Apollo Creed. It's just money and it's your money. So Nene calls out Kenya about the trash that she talked about Christopher and Natalie. And Christopher tells Kenya that he doesn't know what kind of medication that she's on. And Kenya, the ex-model that has been reduced to being a reality TV spectacle, says that she is on the same medication that he is on. Then she decides to hop up and approach Natalie talking shit. So Chris, in a very respectful, old school gentleman way, gently grabs Kenya's arm, and as he's calmly speaking to her, Kenya's gay pet Brendan, who has been fooled into thinking that he's Suge Knight because he's bald-headed, brown, and wearing all red, decides to push Chris's hand away and starts screaming like a banshee at him. So they start screaming about hands and touching and I haven't seen black people so hyped up about hands and touching since 
Michael Jackson had his sleepovers. Who besides me misses the 90s? So anyway, Brandon is yelling at Chris and whatnot, and Peter the skunk hops up and starts spraying people with a skunk juice and just jumps up in between them. So when Chris got a sniff and a whiff of that skunk spray, he freaked out and pushed Brendan back. And Brandon almost beat the mothballs out of Peter just to get at Chris. Then Apollo the criminal, the animal, himself hops up and pushes Brandon down on the couch and begins attacking him. Now, I don't know if dude reminded him of his old cellmate that did him wrong or something, but this shit was like watching Oz on HBO or something. All I do know is that the dark-skinned people were probably really happy to see it. It was just a bunch of light-skinned folks acting a fool, minus Kenya, who thinks that she's light-skinned. Anyway, I wonder if this ass-whooping would be considered to be a hate crime. Considering that Brandon is gay, would it be classified as a homicide? Who knows? What I do know is that Chuck did the same thing that I would have done. He hid. Damn right. I'm not getting scratched or beaten off for reality TV. And that was about it. Because you gotta wait until the next show to find out what happened from there. Yeah, the show will not air for two weeks, so that means that the January 26th 2014 episode will not resume until February 9th, 2014, which is on a Sunday. I will give, and this is why I'll be marrying a white woman, one more chance. Yeah, I'll watch and review episode 14 of season 6 of The Real Housewives of Atlanta. It'll be better than this one. So I'll see you next week for the next review. And don't forget to comment below and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more reviews, recaps, and opinions. And if you likey, share the video on Facebook. Ooh, look at me talking like a damn Hispanic. This is why white folks, see, can't get any words out. This is why white folks make fun of our lips. Let me try this again. See you next week for the next review. And don't forget to comment below and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more reviews, recaps, and opinions. And if you likey, share the video on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, MySpace, or two cans with a string in the middle. In other words, tell a fucking friend.